It's May now, and since I am apparently in the most coveted advertising demographic for motorcycle dealerships for some reason, I am being bombarded with messages saying that the riding season is here. That got me thinking. You know, riding season is here. I know, right? That's a wholly original thought that I came up with on my own. If you're thinking about hopping on a motorcycle for the first time this year, you've got a ton of great choices for your first bike. There's the Ninja 400, which is pretty much the answer to every beginner bike question ever, the SV650 if you're feeling something with a bit more power, and the Turbo Busa if you're a galaxy brain stable genius. But those are starting to get played out. As much as I love my Turbo Busa, if I had a nickel for every time I saw a beginner tooling around on one, well, I'd probably have one nickel because it's a joke and nobody actually rides them, but the point remains. There's a lot of bikes you keep seeing recommended over and over again, so today we're pulling an Apple circa 1976 and thinking differently. The bikes on this list are not going to be on the list of top 10 beginner bikes of all time, mostly because they're a little old from lesser known manufacturers or a bit gunned out in their categories, but rest assured, they're great choices. These bikes tend to be cheaper than the competition with some of the same or better features and all the joys that come with having to explain yourself constantly when someone asks why you didn't just get a Ninja 400. There's a bunch of bikes on this list so I'm going to hit you with the good old fashioned tier list based on the order of price, availability and dealer support since not every noob wants to wrench on their brand new bike. Also there's no E tier because when was the last time you get an E grade in school? But yammy, yeah, you don't get S ranks in school either, no but you don't get E ranks in Devil May Cry either so shut up. Before we dive in, a word from today's sponsor, Manscaped. Whew, jeez. All right guys, as you know, as motorcyclists, sometimes you got some crazy smelling fluids lying around in the shop. Some sort of mixture of gas and oil and crazy stuff that just stinks up the place. But you know what else is stinking up the place? You, with all your gooch juice walking in here. Don't worry, Manscaped has the solution. They've just released a brand new line of body wash, shampoo and conditioner, deodorant, hydrating spray for your body. That's crazy, you don't have to rub it anymore. That's fantastic. Deodorant and lip balm as well. I know you got crusty lips after riding and I don't wanna see them. Hit the link down below and get yourself 20% off your order added automatically and free shipping as well. Get yourself on stink. Okay, everything needs a good foundation to build on and this list is no different. The only problem with this foundation is it's infested with termites and shifted with age. Look, all I'm saying is do not get this motorcycle. What bike? Why the Suzuki S40, the cruiser with a traumatic brain injury. This is straight from Suzuki's website, people. The Suzuki Boulevard S40 takes a timeless single cylinder design with a blackout treatment and adds a shot of advanced Suzuki technology to create a bike that combines exciting performance and a bold appearance with rock solid reliability. Oh, advanced Suzuki technology, huh? What, like the drum brake in the year? It's advanced Makuni carburetor? Or how about that DR650 engine making 31 horsepower and 37 foot pounds of torque? This bike is trash. It belongs in the dumpster next to the Honda CB500. Let's forget the S40 and move on to some bike that you could spend your money on and not feel like a sad sack wannabe cruiser boy. The D tier bikes are either so specific in their use case or that they're too limited to be a daily rider that they're rendered superfluous by other bikes further up the list. Let's start with the Kimco Spade 150i. No, it's not a BMW, although it sounds like one. If this is your first time hearing about it, it's basically a Grom clone, but it's dirt cheap. 3,399 bucks with a 149cc engine putting down 12 horsepower and 8 foot-pounds of Torgos. This one's basically just for college students looking for a way to get around campus or Jimmy John's delivery drivers looking for a more thrilling way to sling subs than driving around in their Nissan Altima. It's a bike that's only good as a city bopper, but hey, if that's what you're looking for, it is cheaper than a Grom. Personally, I wouldn't recommend this as your starter bike because it'll teach you some bad habits, but I'd rather spend an afternoon on this than the S40. Next up in the D tier is the Royal Enfield Himalayan. Let's go over the good stuff. It's a full-size adventure bike. And we're done. I will concede that Royal Enfield is doing some cool stuff with this motorcycle, like sending their riders to the South Pole or making all the C-suite executives ride it so they understand the bike they're making and the fact it's really cheap. But other than that, it's a pretty abysmal bike. A single 411cc air-cooled motor making only 25 horsepower and 24 foot -ton pounds of torque while weighing in at 421 pounds without the bags. This is a bike that won't get out of its own way on the road. 
You're gonna have to full throttle it everywhere just to go the speed limit. There are better choices in this segment. Also, it's a roll end field, so I have to dock at some points just on the face. At least it has a 21 inch front end, which is more than most bikes in the segments, I suppose. Our last entry on the D tier list is the Cleveland Cycle Works Ace 400. It's a discount roll end field Continental GT650, which itself is a discount Triumph Bonneville. Much like the Royal Enfield, it's got a lot of style for not a lot of cash. It comes in at 3,700 bucks with the claimed 80 mpgs and a cruising speed of 70 miles per hour, thanks to its 400 cc single putting down 28 horsepower. The good news for the Ace is that it only weighs 287 pounds, which means that unlike the rest of these underpowered, overweight motorcycles, it might actually be fun to ride. The reason that this motorcycle finds itself in the D tier is down to the lack of dealer support. They're working on growing their network, but in the short term, you'd have to order them online and service them yourself. The bikes are pretty basic, so it's not hard. It's just not something that the average beginner is going to want to do. Like we always say here, spend more time riding than wrenching. Moving up the tier ladder, we have the C tier motorcycles. These are bikes that you can, and in some cases, maybe should spend your money on. They're solid choices, perhaps not the best. They're bikes with reason to be fully functional, but held back by one or two glaring flaws that keep them from ascending to greatness. There's a lot of bikes in the C tier, but if they fix their issues, you might see them off the esoteric bikes list and on a more competitive list. Take the KLR 650, for example. Sure, it's a dirt cheap adventure bike. It's still a way better version of the Himalayan in just about every way. It makes more power, not much more, but it's still putting down 40 horsepower and 39 foot-pounds of torques, and that's a perfectly appropriate number for highway cruising, adventure riding, city bopping, and everything in between. Would it be nice if a 650 was making more power? Yes, obviously, but this is an ancient thumper. We'll cut it a bit of a break. Where I'm not willing to cut it any slack is at the scale. This thing weighs in at 480 pounds in the adventure trim with all the stuff on it. That is a metric crap ton when compared to bikes with more power and weighing less. Also, after 40 years of production, why do they still insist on keeping the same old flaws from the older generations? If you want a bike that can do everything but nothing well, the KLR is a good choice, but that sounds like a C student work to me. Joining the KLR in the C tier is the BMW G310G. It's like the worst version of the KTM 390 Adventure. Both bikes have cast wheels, street ergos, and adventure styling for people who want the look of an ADV bike, but with none of the off-road capability. Cue the butthurt KTM people claiming that they did the tat on their 390 last weekend. Yeah, I'm sure you made it all 4,000 miles plus in two days, bud, whatever you say. The BMW is a perfectly adequate motorcycle, but as an adventure bike, it leaves a lot to be desired. It's also outgunned in the category with only 34 horsepower and 20 foot-pounds of torque and a wet weight of 300. 86 pounds. Also, basically, there's nothing to offer in terms of tech. I hope you like ABS because that's all you get. It's cheaper than the KCM, costing only 5,695 bucks. But if you're looking for a starter adventure bike, the KLR seems like a better choice. Though we're still only in the C tier. Speaking of which, how about the Benelli 302S? It costs 4,299 bucks, has a 300cc engine, makes 37 horsepower and 19 foot-pounds of torque. Those aren't half bad number. Sure, it might be a tad bit slow thanks to its heavy 408 pound wet weight, but it's a lot more desirable than any other bikes on this list. Stylistically, it looks a bit like a Duke 390 and a Ducati Monster had a baby, so what's the problem? Well, the issue in my mind is going to come down to reliability. Look, we've got a Benelli in the shop right now. More on that later, and it's going strong now, but in the long run, who knows? And also, it may or may not be leaking a tiny bit of oil. Let's face it, it's a Chinese engine and Italian motorcycle, and throw on top of that that it's a small displacement bike, which generally aren't built to the same level of quality, and I'm left wondering. I don't think it'll explode, but will it be reliable in two years' time? Who's to say? Last up on the C tier is the Yamaha SR400. This was a weird bike the Yamaha ran for just a few years. They positioned it as one of the new bikes built for old school ones, but man, Yamaha really wasn't playing with this one. It was a Kickstart bike sold new in 2017. I know some of you dirt boys are saying the Kickstarters are great, but on street bikes, we haven't seen those for decades. The only reason this thing is so high up on the list is because you can find them going for nothing nowadays. There aren't a ton of them out there, but if you can find one, you've got a bike that'll get you to where you need to go, nothing more, nothing less. It is a 399cc air-cooled single, it made 27 horsepower and 20 foot-pounds of torque, but it was sub 400 pounds. If you want a motorcycle that isn't just some retro poser bike, but you don't feel like getting something from before you were born, the SR400 is a decent choice. At $6,000 new, this bike is solidly F-tier, but if you can find it secondhand for a few grand, then sure, I could see it being C-tier.
All right, it's B tier time, baby. These are motorcycles that you can buy with confidence knowing you made a big brand choice. They're not perfect, either being a bit overpriced or something you might grow out of, but for the time you have them, these bikes will provide plenty of smiles per gallon. Let's start off one that will pain me dearly, the Royal Enfield 650 P-Twins. Stop, just stop, Royal Enfield people. I can hear you shattering orgasms from here and it's just really upsetting. I can't think that Royal Enfield 650s offer a lot for the dollar. Apparently, they have enough curb appeal that some normies think that they cost $25,000. We did an entire video on one, so I won't spend a ton of time talking about it, but suffice it to say, this bike was pretty charming. It has a good sound, a lot of attention to detail, and while the brakes are woeful, the overall package is more than the sum of its parts. Speaking of more than the sum of its parts, the Kawasaki Versus X300. Why doesn't Kawi update this with the Ninja 400 engine is beyond me, but aside that, it's the only Versus that you should consider. The 650 can join the S40 and the CV500s in the burning dumpster, but this little 300 I could actually recommend to people. Unlike the stupid, ugly, abysmal, wretched, disgusting Versus 650, the X300 has the spoke wheels and a 19-inch front end, so you could spoon off-road rubber on this bike and not look like a dork overcompensating for something. Making only 40 horsepower and 19 foot-pounds of torque, it could really benefit from that 400 engine, and then you might be looking at a Duke 390 killer, but nope, Kawasaki's pulling a Suzuki and just letting it sit as is. If they drop that 400 engine in here, A tier all day. Now, I have a bit of a weird one here, and I'm not sure whether it's an A tier or a B tier bike. The problem is that it has A tier bones, but considering how competitive its space is, I'm not sure I can recommend it as to go over to the other bikes. The Benelli TRK 502X has the same 499cc parallel tune from the Leoncino, more on that later, which makes 48 horsepower and 33 foot-pounds of torque. It has an approachable-ish 33-inch seat height, which isn't too far off for an adventure bike, and has the all-important 19-inch front end so you can roll over stuff off-road. The rear shock is fully adjusted which is a premium feature, but nothing for the front end. It looks like a combination of the R1250 GS and the Tiger 850, and because it's an ADV bike, you can get massive hard bags for it. It's a tad pricey with a base price of $7,099, and there's an all-important reliability issue, but heck, if you're looking to get an ADV bike that'll make a KLR owner jealous, the TRK could be the right call. I'd have to test it personally to make the judgment call between A and B tier, but on paper, it seems to be worth every penny of its purchase price. Then there's the A tier. Look guys, there's only one bike I could really think to put in here in this kind of esoteric beginner bike category, and that's the Benelli Leoncino. First of all, it has a hood ornament on the fender, and that's the best thing in the world. Every motorcycle with any pride in of itself should have a hood ornament as cool as the Leoncino, but fantastic bits and bobs aside, the bike itself proves to the world that 500cc sport bikes don't need to suck. Do you hear me, Honda? Benelli just kicked you in the testicles and stole your lunch money. Once again, I have an entire video on this thing, and Spite's got one coming out soon, but as a beginner bike, I'm struggling to think of one that can keep up with the Leoncino that isn't from the usual suspects of SV650s, R3s, Ninja 400s, and those things. That's about the highest praise I can think of. Aside from the questionable reliability long-term from the engine and the Chinese stuff, the rest of the package is yam approved. And so we arrive at the S tier. It is lonely at the top. There is only one motorcycle that transcends the realm of beginner bikes and grows with you as your tastes change. This is where people who have watched one of these videos all the way to the end starts thinking Turbo Busa thoughts, but no, that's too mainstream, come on. Also, try taking a Turbo Busa off-road around a racetrack. Hard pass. On a Jixer 250, though? Sure. Look, I may have absolutely demolished our Jixer 250 after a year, and some of you might be thinking I killed it because I hated it, but that engine was so hopelessly underpowered, the suspension so crappy, that it did not deserve to live. The reality is the exact opposite. As a track weapon, the Jixer is so powerful you can literally be wide open throttle all of the time. You don't even need to touch the brakes. I'm serious. I took this thing on track. I have a video of it. I literally held it wide open around an entire racetrack. It was hilarious. Engine braking? What is that? I spun a whole bunch of laps on this thing and probably set a world record Jixer 250 lap time because you're basically 100% full gas. With the track conquered, the street posed no more challenge, so we set our eyes to the dirt and built the most capable scrambler ever. It climbed hills on RS10s, cleared jumps like a champion, and broke only a little bit. Once we put the TKC-80s on it, it was impossible to defeat. There wasn't anything that could keep up with the humble Jixer 250. Guys, we had to kill the Jixer because it became too powerful. We saved the world from Jixer apocalypse. We'd all be riding Jixer 250s in the future if we hadn't done what we did. You're welcome. Fact! President Jefferson hated formal affairs so much that he would often greet foreign dignitaries while wearing pajamas. Goodbye. Well, look at you. You've made it to the end of another Yammy Noob video. You should consider yourself pretty lucky because I have curated this one right over here for you to continue watching. It's probably just as good as the one you just saw. 
Unless you hated the one you just saw. I don't know, maybe leave me a comment down below about how you much you hated it as well too. Or just keep watching this one. Make sure you keep watching Yammy Noob. Don't forget to keep watching Yammy Noob. That's the most important thing. Keep watching Yammy Noob.